Okay. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you are receiving our webinar. We just had a couple of little technical issues uh, a few minutes ago. So here's hoping uh, that we are broadcasting. Uh, welcome today to the latest in the In Conversation series that's provided by Opus Centre. Um, my name is Leanne McNeil. I'm the General Manager for Opus Centre here uh, in the ANZ region. And if you're new, we've got 70 registrations um, for this webinar, which is quite exciting. Um, but if you've uh, never joined us previously, uh, Opus Centre provides um, really technological solutions for the deaf care industry, particularly through the management of sedentary records uh, and those sorts of things. So if you've never heard us, we'll put you, uh, give you a, an email address a little later on in the session so you can have a look or either jump onto our website. But in the meantime, um, Today during our Zoom webinar, there's going to be uh, a few options for you. I'll introduce our speaker, Lisa, to you in a little moment. Um, but if you've got any questions for us today, uh, you can see with your icons along the bottom, there's a Q&A button. If you have any questions at all, please use that Q&A button there to ask them. Uh, Lisa's very candid, so we're happy to um, take any questions during the presentation rather than wait for the end. So that Q&A button there is the one that you want. Um, I'll also let you all know that we're recording the session today. That session uh, can be provided later. So if somebody that you know misses the session today, they can obtain a recording of it later and we'll post those things uh, for people to log into. Uh, we also prepare a transcript of the session as well. So that transcript can also be made available. Uh, as I said, our guest today, I'm very pleased to introduce and welcome Lisa Herbert to you today. I have had the pleasure of having a couple of conversations with Lisa prior to today. And if we can keep the webinar to time, I suspect we'll both be doing very well. <laughs> um, um, so um, in particular, I just wanted to share, I suppose, that Opus, in, Opus Centre uh, in doing our conversation series, we like to keep them relevant for our audiences. Um, and in particular this month, um, we asked Lisa if she would be willing to participate. Um, kind of, I guess, the association with Dying to Know Day, which of course occurs on the 8th of August. If you've never heard of Dying to Know Day, it really is an annual campaign to encourage people to start those conversations about death and death planning. And of course, that's something that Lisa is very passionate about as the author of the bottom draw book. I know you've got it up behind you there, Lisa, but I've also got my copy of my book in front of me as well. Um, uh, and Lisa, I hope, is going to talk a little bit about that book today. So, um, yeah, so today is all about talking about death uh, planning cemeteries and really anything that you would like to talk about today. Uh, as I mentioned, Lisa is very candid, so um, please don't be offended, I guess, by any of the conversations that happen today. This is a reality for everybody and it is something that we do need to be talking about. Um, so Lisa, look, I might just hand straight over to you to introduce yourself and take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Leanne. Hello, everyone. Um, I did put on Facebook that if you're locked down, you are welcome to have a wine. Um, <laughs> it's a very candid conversation. It will get fairly blunt from time to time. It'll be fascinating and interesting, but it will be quite blunt. So you, um, the good thing about being in a webinar, if you need to excuse yourself and make yourself a cup of tea or pour a glass of wine, please go ahead. Um, I'm so thankful you are here. I'm so thankful that you're willing to find out more about the inevitable. Um, Western society is pretty bad at this stuff. So the reason I wrote the bottom draw book, the After Death Action Plan, is to get people talking. Um, and I love to talk, as does Leanne. Um, and I need to give you some background on Leanne. She's, um, she's a dark horse here and she her information is huge. Um, Leanne's worked in cemeteries and crematoriums for ages and um, also uh, on the board of directors of the Australasian Cemeteries and Crematory Association. So between us, there's a fair bit of knowledge and curiosity. So we really value your questions. So, so please ask us questions. Look, I'm just gonna spend the first five minutes, just gonna share my screen and let you know how I kind of fit into the business, um, why I'm here and what I have to offer. 
scream if you can't hear, um, see the screen. Whoops. All right. This is this kind of sums up what dying to know day is all a day about. It's opening the conversation that when a person is born, we celebrate, we send flowers, we have, you know, we have parties and showers. And when they're married, exactly the same, we celebrate. But when they die, we try to pretend nothing's happened. Everyone goes really quiet. So I'd like to change that. So what is the bottom draw book? It's an informative, colourful workbook to help things get in order. It's a really down to earth, modern way of writing down your, your story and also your wishes for your end of life, for your funeral. It's got lots of information in it. So it just doesn't say, hey, do you wanna be buried or cremated? There's information about what these things are. And I'm working on another edition that also has some um, information about other body disposal methods, which we will, we will talk about, no doubt. It's things like giving your family permission to spend $500 on your coffin instead of $5,000 on your coffin. Because everyone knows when you're grieving, it's so easy to want to show your love to your grandma or your partner with expensive things that you may not be able to, able, able to afford. But if you'd had that conversation previously, you would know that, oh, hang on, grandma wanted a cheap coffin. She was a top chick and she wanted to put the money on the bar. So having that conversation will save you money or it might cost you money, you never know. Um, so that's the kind of thing the bottom drawer book is. It's not as gloomy as it sounds. Um, my book is full of colourful illustrations, again, because I didn't want it confrontational. I wanted it really friendly and as welcoming as this topic can possibly be. How it all started. This is Barry Delaney at the funeral of his best mate, Private Kevin Elliott. I remember when I saw this photo, I remember exactly where it was, where I was and how I felt when I saw this photo. This photograph is by Jeff Mitchell of Getty Images and it shows um, Barry at his best mate's funeral in Scotland in 2009. Barry, as you can see, wore an outlandish dress to the funeral of, of his mate. Um, Kevin Elliott was a member of the Black Watch, 3rd Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, and he was killed at age 24 in Afghanistan on the 31st of August, 2009. So Private Elliot and Barry Delaney made a pact to wear a dress at the funeral of whoever died first. And what I liked about this photograph, it, it means it's, oh, it's so sad, but it also means they had a conversation about their mortality. And considering that um, Private Elliot was 24, it just shows that you're never too young to have that chat. And that's why when I started working on the book, I wasn't targeting the older member of the communities. I was keen for everyone to have a conversation about their farewell. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. So Kevin Elliott, part of the journey, I wanted Kevin Elliott's family to know the impact that that photograph had on me. So I sent them a copy of my book because in the foreword to my book, I dedicate it to, um, uh, among a few other people's, Private Kevin Elliott. So I sent this book with permission, um, the, uh, the military welfare community in the UK is phenomenal. So they had a support organization. So I went through all the right channels and my book found its way to Private Kelly, Kevin Elliott's family. And here is my most prized possession. It's a thank you card from his grandmother. And this is the first time I've ever read this entire card. So, and I tell you what, I made a mistake of opening this card on the steps of the Tamworth post office. And I sat on the steps and bawled. Um, da, 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 da. Kevin had also spoken of what he wanted to happen if he was killed in active service. He wanted to be dressed in the top of his favorite football team. And he also wanted to have white socks as we did not encourage him to wear white socks, feeling they were not acceptable. He also asked for 20 cigarettes and a box of matches in case the lighter didn't work. A torch, it had to be wind up as a battery torch might run out. And finally, he asked for a mobile phone 
in case a mistake happened and he wanted to be able to call for help. Needless to say, all these requests were made and delivered. What a privilege that this family shared the wishes of the son killed at war. And that just spurred me on. That's why it's so important to have that conversation. The solace and the giggles that they had reading my book. So they all gathered round as a family and friends. And I don't know if Barry Delaney knew, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they included Barry Delaney in these discussions. Um, my family and friends laughed many times during reading it, which is, a, which is brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted this to be a conversation that wasn't dark and morbid. So hence my bottom draw book, the after, after death action plan. Um, there are lots of um, funeral directors these days and um, cemeteries who have their own little checklist on their websites or have a, a notebook available, which is fantastic. Um, as long as you're, you know, you're answering those questions and letting your family know what you want, brilliant. Um, those ones are pretty dark, you know, they're just straight to the point, straight E180. I wanted mine to be colourful and, you know, a bit different. So that's that's how my bottom drawer fits in. So that's why I am. Do we have any questions at this point? I haven't got any coming through yet, but I do want to ask. Um, okay. Lisa, because this is a conversation, um, or I did see a hand just come up in there. Um, so if you want to just post your question, even if it's in the chat or the Q&A, we can ask um, those questions for you. So please just go ahead and post those. Um, but I just, um, I guess I had a question because, you know, having this conversation with my family even. Um, do you think it's possible um, to plan too much, Lisa? Like, do you think it's possible for, I'm, I'm going to, if I'm the one that dies and I says, this is all the things that I want, um, how does that work for those that are left? What's their struggle? That's an interesting discussion because some people find solace going through someone's music collection and they find connection and the family might sit around, for example, to try and um, work out what songs they want played at the funeral. So it brings everyone together to discuss and talk about, hey, remember that time we went to see the Bee Gees and blah, blah, blah. So if someone gives them the song list in their bottom drawer book, they write down the songs they want. There may not be that interaction of that, mm. that, that conversation. Um, so yes, it also depends on the type of person. So if it's someone like me, my friends are going to go, well, obviously it's prepared. Lisa was a control freak and that's what she wanted and that's how we remember her. Um, yeah. And let's understand that more often than not, um, the emails I get are incredible from families who are just lost at the time. Um, there's a blog. I, I write a blog. It's called the bottom draw book dot blog. And there is a blog there um, called da, 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 A Song and a Tattoo, The Gift That Kelly's Mum Left for Her Family. Um, so Kelly bought, Kelly's mum bought my book um, and they didn't think anything more of it, but the mum filled it in. And Kelly says, um, after a long and hard battle with cancer, she passed away peacefully with family by her side. I remember dad saying he'd organised the funeral people to come by the next day. He had a lost look on his face. We all knew she wanted Michael Jackson played, but which of the hundreds of songs did she want? Then I remembered the book. I raced over to the table next to the chair and there it was, the Bible as we called it. The funeral prep was done within half an hour. The director was a the book and couldn't believe we were lucky enough to have it all her wishes right there in one location. No hunting through music or trying to think about what she might like for flowers or what she wanted to be dressed in. It was a lifesaver. We had no idea she wanted, wasn't expecting that by Jamie Lawson played. It went on <laughs> a song that would play randomly on the radio or music channels when I was thinking about her, her little way of communicating from me from beyond. So that's the solace mm. that provided that family but there might be another family who doesn't quite need that, that detail. So it's hard to say. Um, I think any insight that people can give, whether they fill in the entire book or just 
have a conversation after this, you know, don't buy the book after this, but just at least turn to your loved one tonight before you go to bed and you know, you know what, I think I want to be cremated and I want my ashes spread here. That's enough. That's a, that's a great place to start. And when the time does come, your partner goes, she wanted to be cremated and she wanted her ashes scattered down the beach. Perfect. Yeah. There's that solace, that there's that immediate gratitude of, okay, I know that much. That's a great place to start. Yeah, that weight being lifted uh, mm. off a family's shoulders. Yeah. We're getting just some comments coming through. Just a question was asked broadly in the Q and A, just kind of about who was in the um, who was present, I guess, in the in the webinar. Um, and a few people are just starting to comment that um, they're celebrants. So we've got a, quite a few celebrants that are that are in the room. How can this book then be used by people, I guess, professional people in the industry, not just from a personal perspective around how we plan our own funerals or, or whatever it is that we want? What about for professionals? Can they use it too? Absolutely. And um, celebrants and funeral directors are such important people. It's their job to deliver the story of the person who's died. Sure, a family member can do it, but... It, it can be quite tough to, to hold the whole, the whole, the whole, hold the whole funeral. Um, <laughs> yeah. So certainly, you know, get up and do your eulogy, but to carry through the entire service is, is pretty tricky. That's why these people are so important. And the book offers, um, and again, it seems like I'm plugging the book, but I just want, you don't have to buy the book, just write it down somewhere. So mm. I, um, I ask people in my book, um, list the most outrageous things you've done. Um, what are the things you're most proud of? What have, have you been your life's most valuable lessons? List 10 or so words that describe you and your life, blah, blah, blah. So a funeral director, the family, um, the celebrant can read these and then mould the eulogy, mould the service around the humour that's in here or the dark mm. thoughts that are in here, whatever else. It's, it's all here. It's all written down in their own words. And again, um, I had a, um, an Anglican priest contact me, a retired Anglican priest, who they found the book that um, a lady died. The family don't know where she got the book, but they, she died and there was the book right beside her in the drawer. And she wanted her favourite hymn played, Oh Ye Bethlehem or something, and it was August when she died. So the priest and the family loved that they were able to follow her wishes and not feel bad about a Christmas hymn being sung in August. In August. <laughs> so, so that guided the the professionals in the way her her funeral was carried out. And the good thing is, you can imagine everyone singing "Oh, ye Bethlehem" with gusto, <laughs> having a bit of a giggle. That you know, this is exactly what she wanted. Of course, this is her. This is exactly what she wanted. This is the best funeral ever. She would have been happy with this. And they leave that ceremony with a sense of. <sighs> I'm sad, I'm grieving, but all is well. But I think too, then when Christmas comes, they perhaps hear it being played again. And yeah, it'll bring yeah. back some of that sadness too. But I think it also has the potential to bring back that joy of, oh yeah, we, we sang this in August and what an yeah. awesome occasion. Yeah, it's, I can't stress enough, just you don't have to plan the funeral, but just give people, just give your loved ones just an inkling of where to start. And that will make all the difference, an awful lot of difference. So we've got a question that's come through from Trevor, and I'm thinking that Trevor is probably a funeral celebrant. Um, and he's, uh, again, looking at it from a professional perspective. You know, can we be having these conversations with families um, before while the while the individual you know usually their conversation is with the family yep. post the person's death can they be having those conversations with the person and the family beforehand and they I certainly should. can't see why not yeah they should be um whether you're a celebrant or a doula or just a friend absolutely um some of my major clients are palliative care services who bulk buy my book so there are people um yeah, they're obviously, they know they're terminal. And I get emails from people who are very frank about their mortality and that their end is near. And they literally type, hello, Lisa, I am terminally ill. This is the last thing I have to do, blah, blah, blah. So there's, it's very easy for us to 
to step away and go, oh, you poor dear, you're dying. Let's not talk about it. Let's close the curtains. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Not everyone, but most people know it's coming. They may as well be prepared. And I give a lot of public talks and I have people coming to my talks with their seat, waving their CD saying, this is my playlist. I've already got it organized. And they're sitting yeah. out. So there's a lot of people who, who are like me and you who take it on and tackle it on head first. So please don't think that everyone doesn't want to talk about that. As soon as the conversation starts, people just start talking and they don't stop. So I yeah. had um, I did an appearance on Studio 10 when the oh, soon after the book came out back in 2014. And I had an email from a lady and she'd bought 10 books, uh, she'd bought four books for her family. And sadly, again, she told me um, that her son was finally succumbing to his childhood brain tumour. And they didn't want him to be the only one filling in the book because any of them could be going at any time. So they wanted to do this as a family and have a giggle and have some fun. So it comes down to an open conversation and everyone filling in that book. And that offered them you know, an awful lot of solace and so important. And again, I cried when I got that email. I'm, I'm a big sort. Mm. Um, but yeah, so important that it's not only the person that is terminal or dying. This is a conversation for everyone. And absolutely, celebrants, please sit down with, with those who are ready and open to talk about it. Some might, might not be. And that's the advantage of the book. You just leave it with them. It might sit there for mm. a while. They might look at one page a day that's fine. You start, and I have some lawyers, um, some succession planners who do the same thing. They give them the book and then they start talking about what's going to happen to the farm, blah, blah, blah. So it's it's just a colourful way to ease them into it and open that conversation. Um, you just raised that question about kind of succession planning and I'm writing it down so I remember to come back to it because, um, and you, you've kind of have already um, commented on this. Lois asked the question around how do we get past those family members who arrive at the very last minute and don't agree with the wishes. And I guess that is some of that, you know, yeah. let's try to have the conversation beforehand before we're right at that. But, yeah. you know, the reality is the way families, are, some families are these days, there's really going to be disagreement. And there always will be. And that's why... It's like, okay, I filled in my book, mum and dad. You might not agree with it, but here it is. And, you know, in the end, they're going to have the final say. You know, the next of kin will have the final say. Not ideal, but okay. And there are things like I, I talk about organ donation in the book as well. So I, it's not just a, are you an organ donator, tick the box. I ask, why do you want to donate your organs? Mm -hmm. so it can then write down the reasons so it's not just a yes and no answer for the people that have the ultimate say. It's it's getting within about why you think that's important. So you're trying to, you know, describe the emotion behind your decision. So hopefully it will sway them. And it's a similar thing with everything else, that if you can be open and communicative with your family from the start, then that's all you can do. That's all you yeah. can do. Well, and, and Francis, and Francis, I'm going to assume you're a, a funeral celebrant as well. Francis is saying, you know, she said, I've gone through this process only to have the family refuse to follow the deceased's wishes. And Francis, that's a really tough position for, for you to be in, I guess, um, because, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to work for this family, but also trying to do the right thing by this person who has now passed. Yeah. And there's only so much you can do. Um, it's like, okay, if that's what, and this is what it comes down to, does it matter if your wishes are followed? Like you're dead, like you're not going to care. Yeah. You've got to decide and just be an understanding, you know what, I might not get what I want, but at least I've had my say um, and I'm going to come back and haunt them and turn the toilet roll backwards every time, and, <laughs> you know. You know. Um, but, yes, you will always face that there will be people who don't follow your wishes and that's just a fact of life. And yep. as long as you can do what you do, um, try and convince them otherwise um, and just, yeah, there is there's no way you can fix that apart yeah. from and, conversations. 
And look, and I guess that's the thing I'm really seeing, lots of comments coming through uh, on the Q&A about actually different ways that people are using um, the book or the, even themselves are, are putting together um, sort of presentations. I'm just reading through the look through here. Um, uh, you know, going out and doing presentations with Provis clubs. And, and I guess what I get from that is that there does seem to be this willingness to start to talk about uh, our deaths. Now, you talked about succession planning, talking about lawyers and, and succession planning. And I'm always constantly astounded by the statistic that the Groundswell Project uh, always talk about. You know, I think it's, it's you know, around 50% of Australians and New Zealanders die without a will. So, you know, if they're dying without a will, they're certainly not thinking about this stuff. And I think death these days and death planning encapsulates so much more than what music you want played. Mm. What are you going to do with your Instagram account? Who's going to manage your Facebook or your LinkedIn mm. and, and those kinds of things? So advice to families around tackling that, Lisa, what do you think? Yeah, um, knowledge. And I'm going to mention the book again. Um, but <laughs> it comes down to social media, uh, um, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. What are their death policies? And the cool thing is for Facebook, for example, you can action that now. So you can nominate a legacy contact right now. Just go into your settings, your privacy settings, and follow your nose so that when you do die, um, that there's one person or two people that you've nominated that can oversee your Facebook account. And Facebook are very, very smart, and Instagram are very, very smart. It doesn't mean that they will see all your messages and your dirty DMs, you know, the, those naughty, naughty photos. It's not like that. They don't access those messages, but they do access your wall, which means um, you can put up Lisa's funeral is tomorrow. By the way, here's a photo that I saw of her, that from her last Christmas party, you know, and get people talking. Um, so that's Facebook, for example. There are some social medias um, that simply, um, they don't offer that opportunity. You can either leave it up there um, for eternity, it seems, or you can simply um, ask for it to be removed. Um, mm. So you can email Facebook and Twitter and whatever else and say, here is the death certificate, certificate for this person. I'm the executor of the will. Um, we want this account taken down, please. Whatever yeah. else. So there are those policies in play. Um, Google, for example, have come up with a really great policy. Um, let's face it, we've got YouTube, which is Google. We've got yeah. um, emails. We've got Google Drive. Don't know about you, but there's a lot of my accounts and important stuff in my Google Drive. You can nominate yep. a contact to have access to that. And you can also break it down. So one person might get a some of your Google Drive and another person might get another bit of the Google Drive and then there's part of the Google Drive that no one gets. So you can really break that down. Unbelievably, next month and only next month, Apple has finally pulled its finger out. When you consider it, the market share that Apple has, up until now, they've had no death policy. It's atrocious what Apple mm. has been doing. But as of next uh, next month with the latest update, it looks like that people will be able to have a legacy contact um, with Apple. So there's considering the information that's flying around the interweb, um, it's disgraceful how some of these huge companies have not taken legacy contacts and death and dying seriously when it comes to accounts. But finally, the, the tide is turning. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess with more and more, we're starting to see uh, even within sort of, I guess, the cemetery industry or around memorialisation, more and more we're seeing emergences of digital headstones or um, great products that, that, you know, can be uh, included or attached to plaques, which will beam a person's story onto their phone. All fantastic things, but things that still have to be managed. Um, Beverly's just popped a little comment up. Um, AFCC have just produced a document giving people the opportunity to write down all of their passwords, et cetera, for all of the reasons being discussed, which is probably great, but uh, we also want to make sure those things are secured while we're in life too, I guess. Yep. So writing any of those kinds of things down does come with its challenges. Yep. Um, and also there are companies um, that that will offer you a virtual vault. 
So you can put all your documents, all your passwords into a virtual vault. Um, it's very highly protected. It does cost. It's an annual cost that you have to pay. Um, mm. You're paying for all that security. And then when you do die, whoever you nominate gets access to that very private cyber vault. Um, so yes, um, some people say, I'll just write down my passwords in the will. Keep in mind that um, once the will passes probate or you know, gets the big tick by the court, that will does become not public property, but more people can see that will after probate. So yeah, so whether you want all your passwords in there is yeah, a bit iffy. Yeah, it's really quite complicated, isn't it? Yeah, it's very complicated. So if you've got photographs of your of your grandchildren that you you nurture and they're locked in a you know a Flickr account on, on online and you're the only one with the password, I urge you to do something else with those photographs or just leave your password on the fridge. You know, it's it's photos. You know, a robber's not going to care. Um, so yeah. I could your bank details from from your kids, but there's those kind of things that are really important. That yeah, the yeah. passwords will be required for. Can we talk about? Um, I guess we talk about planning. I mean, a part of it is certainly, you know, whether you're going to have a, a funeral in a church, whether you're going to have a, you know, a, a, I don't know, an outdoor barbecue. I mean, let's face it, there's lots of different options these days. There is some uh, kind of research that has been uh, occurring, I know, in some of the universities in Australia around, uh, and I guess it's probably really being um, exacerbated when we think about COVID and some of the restrictions that have meant that people haven't been able to necessarily attend funerals. Um, but some of this research has stretched even to the notion of memorialization. And, you know, are cemeteries or, or the notion of, of uh, ashes being placed in memorial walls and those sorts of things, is that becoming outdated in favour of, you know, we're going to go and spread someone's ashes on the beach um, and, and do it all that way? There is some concern that this lack of, I guess, memorialisation in the traditional sense could create some mental health issues down that track with people failing to grieve or, or memorialise properly. Do you have any views on that? I do have views about memorialisation. Um, I'm a big fan of direct cremation. So that's, that's me. So a direct, yeah. direct cremation is no funeral. And yeah. it's, it's virtually, if I died tomorrow, Funeral director comes, picks me up, takes me straight to the crematorium. Um, my ashes are ready in two weeks. I've told my friends what I want done with my ashes, heading up to Karawinya National Park. So that's that's me. Um, but I would hope for my friends and what they'll they will need. I would hope they will kind of miss me a little bit. Um, my friends will still need to get together and have that that ritual whether it's the week after I die or six months after I die, they're still going to need that. I'm not going to say closure because yeah. death is just the opener as far as I'm concerned. Um, so there is a really important, and all the studies say that you need support, you need people, you need to talk about this thing. So yes, um, there is always a place for communal grieving where people can get together, hug, cry, drink, whatever else it is yeah so, and something else um i find interesting i love cemeteries cemeteries are like libraries they're the holder of mm. stories every grave is a book and it's up to you to take the book out and open it and do your research mm. look at it and, and wonder what life was like in those times more and more people are getting cremated these days um, probably 50%, maybe even more than 50% these days getting cremated. Yeah. Uh, actually, so, actually, it's a lot more. It's, 70%. it's about 70, 78% here in Australia. Yeah. And the thing is, those people's names aren't written anywhere in the cemetery. So when I go to a mm. I, I see a name and I look at the date and, you know, I can trove the cause of death, find a news story, and I, and I know that person's story. But if someone's cremated, I'm never going to see their name. I, I, I don't know that there's a story there. So the question for everyone here, does that matter? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when there's destruction of graves or um, the reusing of graves, like in Perth and South Australia, that kind of thing, because of a lack of room, people are, you know, appalled saying, you must preserve the dead, their memory, um, respect the dead. 
And then I often ask myself, how respected were those people when they were alive? So we yeah. this thing about death where we respect them dead, but we may not have respected them as much alive. So it's a long answer to a, I don't know, a hypothetical question. Yes, it's grieving so important. And I think people's stories are so important in some capacity. But there's this, the saying is you die twice. The first time you die, you take your final breath. Mm. Second time you die is the last time somebody mentions your name. Your name. Yes. That could be two generations, could be three generations, could be one generation. But does mm. in the big scheme of things, are we okay with that? Or do our egos go, yeah, no, I'm not okay with that. I want to be remembered. Yeah. So you've yeah. got to think to yourselves, how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to write your story, whether it's in a book, a blog, whatever else, so that your grandchildren get to know you? Or are you happy just to fade away and no mention of you anymore? Yeah. I think I, I love that you mentioned cemeteries because obviously coming from having sort of managed cemeteries, um, I didn't originally come from the industry, um, but I was struck on, I don't know how many occasions by people I mean ancestry.com it's one of the biggest sort of growing hobbies in the world these days everybody wants to research their family history and uh, for a lot of people that brings them to a cemetery and I was still amazed by the emotion uh, shared by people who when they found the grave of an ancestor that they would never have met and were perhaps you know, a hundred years ago um, that that person had passed. So there is something really powerful in cemeteries and, and or in memorials, I suppose, full stop. Yeah, stories. People's stories are important. And I'm a big fan of old rural cemeteries because they tell a way of life. Um, mm. Everett Grave is in Gum Flat, which is near Inverell in northern New South Wales. And there's, there's a grave with three children, um, three or four children, who died in the 1930s and I and I needed to find that story and it turns out there was a barn fire and so I looked up the article um, in the paper the next day in the Sydney Morning Herald out of Sydney and it tells the extraordinary story of how this fire unfolded and how um, the, the worker had to saddle his horse and gallop into town to raise the alarm so you get this sense of urgency and hard times and a way of life mm. by looking by viewing a grave um and yeah. that that story is important and I told that story on my Facebook page and I got it's it, it exploded it's been shared you know squillion times and now every time I visit that grave there's a new plant or a teddy bear on that grave and I, and I like to think it's because I, I told people the story of that family. Yeah. So I guess if there's cremations or there's, there's no memorial, those stories will be lost. That yeah. said, all those stories could be on the internet. So it's a, it's a different... But how are they shared? That yeah. for me is how do we make sure that they're shared? Yeah. Um, uh, when, you know, when I was a kid, the cemetery kind of really wasn't, I grew up in the, you know, the when I was in my teens, it was the 80s. I think, I think the 80s were kind of the years of the real emergence of, or the new emergence of, of horror movies, you know, and they all stemmed around, you know, the very dark cemetery with the, you know, the, the big metal fences around them. Um, cemeteries have this stigma about them you know they're not places that we go but of course in the Victorian era they were the parks that was where people yes. would take a turn around the cemetery um how do you think we can change I mean I, I guess it's a bit like funeral planning and talking about death they're these things we don't talk about cemeteries are the same how do we get people back into them and seeing them as inviting places that are a wealth of stories I've seen some mad parties in cemeteries. Um, in Darwin, for example, I've walked into a, I'm a cemetery wanderer from way back, actually, walked in this party, and there would have been 15 cars. There were kids running over graves. They were drinking, whatever else. And I thought that was a wonderful use of space. I certainly acknowledged the man down the other side who was trying to have a quiet moment with his wife. But it was great to see that these people didn't fear the cemetery and the kids were growing up. Um, yeah. To, to include grandpa or grandma, whoever it was. Um, so we need, 
And I would like cemeteries to come on board and they are coming on board having open days and telling their yes. stories. I went to a fabulous open day at Mount Gravatt Cemetery in Brisbane uh, a couple of years ago and there, there was no hold bar. Like the mortuary was open, um, very yes. frank yes. discussions. And I learned all this quirky stuff. Like at the time it was in drought and the cockatoos of Brisbane had worked out that in the, um, the little flower vases, the little plastic ones with sponge in the middle, yep. these cockatoos had worked out that that's where the water's kept. So they, they would go through the cemetery, quaking out all these flowers to drink the water. And the families were going, you know, my grave has been violated, you know, my poor ma. And it's like, no, nah, mate, that's just the cockatoos having a drink. Yeah. But those yep. kind of things, these quirky little things about cemeteries and there's Tawong Cemetery in Brisbane, which is massive. Mm -hmm. And it's undulating and it's beautiful. And what I really enjoy at Tawong, I often see people having picnics and, and kicking the football. Yes. There's a there's a big a, grass area. There's a grass area. And they yep. and I thought, I often think, I wonder if they know that they're running over people's graves. Because yep. that was the um, there's so many unmarked graves in cemeteries, both modern and old school cemeteries. There are there's graves everywhere that we walk over. They're just not marked. And in certain sunlight and in certain um, rainfall conditions, you can see the soil disturbance all through Tawong cemeteries. There are several patches of grass that people think, oh, no one's here, let's, let's lay down here. But you can actually see um, that there are grave after grave after grave. And I think that's wonderful. Maybe they do know, and I hope they do know they're playing soccer over, over some children's graves because that, mm. that's the ones that, that are there. Um, but I often wonder, would they still be kicking the footy if they did know that they were great? If grass? they knew. Yeah. yeah. You, you yeah. make a mention of the fact that, um, you know, cemeteries, we are seeing different things happening in cemeteries now. Um, Cherie has made a comment. No, it wasn't Cherie. Sorry. Trevor's made a comment. Yeah. Yes, Centennial Park have put a beautiful new cafe and function centre in their cemeteries. We are seeing a lot more cafes. We're starting to see children's playgrounds um, put into cemeteries. Um, uh, I, I remember speaking to a young mum in a cemetery one day who was there and she was visiting the grave of a child that she had lost. Um, but what she loved was that there was a playground close by or just, you know, it located not far from the children's area, which meant her other children well, could be playing in that playground. So she yeah. didn't see it or those kids weren't going to grow up wow. seeing that as a place where mum was sad, but actually a place that they enjoyed as well. Yeah, and it's so important not to be fearful of those. And and I really, yeah, conversations like this and going to cemeteries to find stories. My friend Darren, um, he's got three three generations in one grave or one plot at Tawong Cemetery, and he's created a garden. So Saturday mornings he'll be there with his, you know, digging sticks and whatever else and planting stuff. And now there are people who he doesn't know that will tend to the same garden. Um, yeah. so it's this little community just by you know giving their cemetery some love but I also and I'm going to be blunt here I am concerned of modern some modern day cemeteries um, that are very cookie cutter and they have rules yeah. that your monument can only be this big and they can't be bland colors or can't be loud colors and stuff and I think that is doing a dis disservice I went to the um uh I think it was Nimbin I dropped in uh to the cemetery there and as you can imagine northern New South Wales quirky arty yeah. kind of thing and their cemetery are just these homemade busts of people and stones and artwork and it's and it's representative representative of that town so I wasn't I wasn't surprised to see this quirky cemetery because it told the story of the town yeah but cookie cutter cookie cutter cemeteries are not telling the story of the town they're telling the story of long boring rows so I, I do have a bit of a problem with that. Yeah. Um, Liam has made a, um, he's asked a question here and it, just going back, I guess, to the story of the children who died in the barn fire. Um, and I guess he's talking a bit about the involvement, I guess, of media uh, in these stories um, and the decline of a lot of local media and, and how this can affect the preservation of stories uh, like this? Because I guess we all used to have our little local newspaper and Liam's absolutely right. A lot of those aren't, uh, aren't being written anymore. And that was where some of these great stories were being shared. 
Very much so. I'm the editor of my local newsletter in country Victoria. Mm. And every newsletter, uh, because this is an age, aging community, every newsletter has the story of someone who's recently died. Um, and that's really important. And that's often the only way these people can communicate amongst themselves, particularly in lockdown, for example. Um, mm. So that's a way, a way of telling stories. And with newspapers, you know, death notices used to be long death notices and in memoriam and all that kind of stuff. And there are more and more people turning away from newspapers because everything's done online these days. So yeah. are losing these stories. So I really do urge you to write them down or even record them. You know, grab your phone. Everyone's got a recorder thing on your phone. Next time you're with Nan, say, so Nan, tell us about that recipe and and how you used to make cakes in the 1940s. Yep. So capture the voice and the nuances, and then you just save that in, you know, a USB, distribute it. So when the time comes, you've still got the sound and the story, at least one story from her. So yep. capture the stories as, as best you can in any way you can. Just write them yep. down. You may think you're boring, but I can guarantee you you're not. Yeah. A lot of what we've talked about really has revolved a bit around change you know this is a, a an industry really quite broadly that that is changing um Lamise has commented here and, and I apologize if uh, that's not how I pronounce your name but we don't have many green options here in Australia um you know and, and some thoughts around that um we are seeing a lot of change. We are seeing green uh, burials starting to open up, although take up has been slow. Uh, but then we're seeing some of the other composting, resumation, um, some of those sorts of things certainly starting to emerge overseas. It's really interesting. Um, natural burial grounds, there is no standalone natural burial ground in Australia. There are um, cemeteries with natural burial grounds attached which is a great start. And when we talk about natural burials, we talk about um, just thinking the environment, well, thinking with the environment in, in mind. So you're not burying your loved one in polyester, you know, a material that's never going to break down. Mm. Not burying your person full of chemicals, for example, if they've been embal embalmed. So that's when we talk about a natural burial. That's what we're, we're talking about. You know, mm. coffins without... Um, heaps of lacquers and glues and things so I'm interested in your comment and it's a comment I found as well this natural burial ground thing has been bubbling away probably more and more for over the last decade but I'm not seeing the uptake in natural burials it might be because the people who want a natural burial aren't dead yet um, and maybe in 20 30 years that's when natural natural burial grounds go boom but I'm really interested in your take about how everyone says, oh, yes, we want to be environmentally friendly. But when it comes to the crunch, why are we not burying the dead in those natural yeah. burials? Yeah. I think uh, some of my personal experience has been um, there is some reluctance on behalf of some of the traditional funeral directors. Uh, I think that's changing. I think it is a slow change. Um, but even families themselves, what we have found with some of what you would think is as close to a greener burial area and that there, um, there's no markers. And that seems to be the one thing that um, continually challenges families. Um, they want some form of marker. So when you say to them, there's no headstones, there's no anything here, it is literally just a green field, it's definitely something that they balk at at the end of the day. Yeah, and a lot of those... Um... Uh, you identify the grave with a microchip or GPS. So yeah. you could be trying to find your gran and you're celebrating your gran's birthday and standing around where you think her grave, but you're chatting to a stranger and he's loving it, but, you know, you might be at the wrong grave. So yeah. that's an interesting take. And, again, does it matter that you, yes. you're not right there at your person's grave? I, I don't know. But, yeah, I can. the uptake has been a bit slow, well, slower than I think a lot of people yeah. But you've mentioned yeah. other other options. Oh, I'm just going to read Liam's comment. I think part of the issue involves a misperception concerning environmental impact of cremation versus cremation. Namely, cremation has a greater environmental um, impact, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and when it comes to environmental impact, this one's a minefield. Um, mm -hmm. Think of burial 
um, a lot of people don't think of the mowing and the fertilizing of the grass and the ongoing maintenance of that grave and all those hundreds of graves around it. Yeah. Cremation, yes, there's a heap of gas use. Um, you know, you're, you're burning someone at 900 degrees Celsius yeah. for up to 90 minutes or even longer. That's a whole yeah. lot of gas you're using. But people, again, it's like you're still, all these cars are driving to the funeral. You're still, yeah, I don't know what the answer is here. I, I don't think there's a true environmentally friendly option I was talking I wasn't talking rather emailing there's three companies in the United States that are looking at human composting um, yes. and one of those and I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about human composting because there was a little bit of media around that last year and um, it's called national uh, natural organic reduction for those who haven't heard of it and it's it started in Seattle in Washington so the top left hand side of the United States if you're looking at a map um, and it's defined in the state law there that it's the, con the contained accelerated conversion of human remains into soil. So it's just, yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's human composting. Um, and there's a company um, called Terramation who I, I queried them only yesterday about the nutrient value of their soil um da, 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 da. bear with me so yes um i'm just i'm just reading the email from our compost reports show that the terramated remains contain potassium calcium magnesium nitrogen sodium and other non-toxic elements that are beneficial to the earth it's so nutrient dense that we have to a care guide for our families to let them know how to use the remains as a proper ratio so they say 20 percent of your remains to 80% of soil or just one or two inches on top of, you know, your garden, whatever else. But this, it, the thing about Terramation, this company, they also, they say like um, human composting is only legal in a couple of states in the US at the moment. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to get bigger, but this company is offering a nationwide service. So I queried them and I say, what, do you have a mobile capsule? Um, or how does it work? And they say, no, we will move your person. We will move your body. So you've got to think of those carbon miles of moving a body from Florida up to Seattle, for example, <laughs> to have an environmentally conscious, you know, this body. Yeah. So it's it's one thing to say, yeah, I, I want to save the environment when I die, but let's drive 4,000 kilometres in a car with fumes. So it, it, it negates that. So just something for people to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of still skimming. We have had so many questions and comments. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I think the one thing I'm hearing from every, I mean, there's lots of interest. And I think that's the thing that's so fascinating about it is that people are starting to talk. Um, please continue to feed through if you've got um, sort of other questions and we'll try to get them in before Zoom kicks us off at uh, 1130. But I did, I guess one of the things that, um, that what I'm hearing is there's options to your funeral. You, some will want the tradition, some will want the party. There's an option uh, to, you know, do you want to be buried? Do you want to be cremated? Do you want to consider the green option and some of those uh, new technologies that are happening overseas? How do you want to be remembered and memorialised? How are you going to manage your Facebook accounts and all of those sorts of things? And I think for me, and certainly after talking to you, it all comes back to you do need to think about it. You do need to do your research as you would any other product that you were looking at purchasing in reality. And you do need to have conversations with people about it. Um, I think I, regardless, I mean, we could talk about this stuff for hours, but that is the one big message that comes out of it all. And the message is being informed allows you to make informed decisions at what may just be the worst time of your life. Yeah. Funeral directors have a very important role they put up with so much stuff because you can you imagine the state that people are in when dealing 
with this. So I want people to be informed and have that discussion because funerals are big business. You pay what, you know, you pay a lot of money for their services. So I want you to have the best services you possibly can. And there is no one size fits all funeral. I've noticed some funeral directors are very traditional, stuck in their way. Mm. But then there is, there's this emerging and has been quite emerging for a while, these, these new funky funeral directors. Yep. So as long as people are informed and they don't have to stay with the first funeral director who's in the phone book, please get mm. quotes. If you're going to spend 10, 15 grand getting your kitchen redone, you're going to get quotes. You're going to go yes. through rooms beautiful and look at all the designs you're going to do your research I urge you to do that research with funeral directors so you know that you go to a chapel now all the chairs are laid like they're all lined up in a row it's really boring it's it's cold it's the it, that's the traditional way of doing funerals you have every right to say you know what I don't want those chairs in rows can we, with the coffin at the end of the chapel, can we put the chairs in a circle? Can we put the coffin in the middle? Can we take the chairs outside? Hell, can we go to the pub? You know, they, these are all very real options for your funeral and the funeral of your loved ones. So if you cross a funeral director and you say, this is what I want, and they go, yeah, no, I can't do that, find another funeral director. But I found funeral directors are amazingly open to conversations. So if, if you've got any questions after this, call your local funeral director. They're always up for a chat. I found them brilliant researching my book. I was just cold calling funeral directors all over the country and they were so willing to help me and have that conversation. Um, so please do the same. If you've got a, a group of mates and you've got a heap of questions, call up your funeral director and say, hey, listen, can we pop in for half an hour? Um, see your mortuary, you know, see what you do and learn that way please if yep. you've got a lion's club organize it you might have to sell it a bit more but you know <laughs> your group on the minibus to head to a couple of funeral directors places so you can be yep. involved you can see you know everything that's involved so yep. yeah please search for some information and make those funeral directors earn their dollars because they're, they're big dollars but um they do offer a very important service um when we're talking about options, I do want to give your book a plug again, Lisa. Where can people buy the book? Uh, Thebottomdrawbook.com.au. Um, I'm COVID has stuffed up my next print run, so I'm <laughs> running really low. But if you email me via that website, um, Secret Squirrel, and I haven't told anyone yet, um, within a couple of weeks there will be an ebook version available. Fantastic. So if I don't have the physical book, which is highly unlikely because COVID has stopped my print run in Brisbane, um, that there will be um, an ebook available. So Lisa at the bottom drawbook.com.au. Fantastic. Now look, Lisa's book, as she said, it's uh, it's really candid, it's funny, there's some great little quotes and great little uh, pictures in it. If candid isn't necessarily going to work for you and possibly for some of your clients, uh, Lisa and I have also talked, there's a range of these sorts of resources around. So you can certainly Google them. Um, I've also got Life Legacy and Love. Um, this is a, a book that was uh, written by the team at Centenary Memorial Gardens here in Brisbane. So it, it is, uh, I guess, much more formal, very detailed, but I guess that's what we've been talking about today. It's been about exploring your options and, uh, and, and getting what's right for you to enable you to have these conversations and to do some planning. So look, uh, on behalf of, uh, from me, Great conversation, Lisa. You're obviously in Brisbane. So when COVID stops uh, wreaking havoc up here, I will be making time to have coffee and chat some more. <laughs> I'm stuck in Victoria. So. You're stuck in Victoria. I know that. Yes. <laughs> um, um, I also want to thank the Groundswell Project, um, not only yeah. for everything that they do around Dying to Know Day, but because you publicised uh, our webinar here today, we've had such a great turnout. 
and lots of fantastic comments continuing to come through. As I mentioned, uh, I'm the general manager for OPA Centre. Uh, we do cemetery mapping, uh, records management, and, and solutions to help cemeteries, big cemeteries, small cemeteries, crematoriums, funeral operations. So you can also have a look at what we do at opacenter.com. So um, for everybody that's joined us, thank you very much. We do run these every couple of months and we always have great speakers and Lisa's just another fine example of that. Thank you, Lisa, so much for your time. What a pleasure. No worries. My Facebook page is the bottom draw book of the After Death Action Plan. Please send me a message or contact me by my website. I can see quite a few questions coming up. So thanks so much for being so thoughtful and considering your options. It's a great start. Well done. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, everybody else. Have a great weekend. Bye now.